Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ira Gunning, and thank you so much for joining us for our FICA What is the Risk Based Approach webinar, which is a repeat of a previous webinar because we've had quite a few requests for that. I'm joined by my colleagues Suad and Jimmy, and they will introduce themselves. But once again, thank you very much for joining us. If you have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A chat. Um, if we don't get to answer them during the session, we will get back to you afterwards. Our email addresses will also be shared with everybody. So if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out. So yes, as I said, I'm Ira Gunning. I'm an executive in our banking and finance department at ENS Africa, and I specialize in consumer and data protection and anti-money laundering. And that is where we're going to start the session today. What is money laundering? So money laundering is washing illegal funds. So in ordinary layman's terms, it's taking funds that came from unlawful sources, such as drug money, or from hijackings, or from illegal alcohol sales, and trying to get that into the system and making it seem legit. So you're taking tainted money, and you're trying to make it look clean. So why do you do that? Because you're trying to get your money into the banking system so that you can do EFTs and the like. Of course, you don't want to sit with a case full of cash under your bed. So that is what money laundering is. Terrorist financing, clearly it is aiding and abetting terrorists, paying for the likes of 9-11, funding it. And the third thing on the radar of our regulators is the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And this is the funding and distribution of nuclear weapons. So helping people to either make or distribute nukes. Now, clearly, nukes, terrorist financing, money laundering are bad things. And that is why it's on the radar of our regulators and why we have laws to prevent it. And this is where the Financial Action Task Force comes in. The Financial Action Task Force is an intergovernmental body, and it is the anti-money laundering watchdog. And members of the FATF agree to implement the recommendations made by the FATF. So the FATF makes recommendations. They cannot automatically apply in the local laws of a country. So they say to the country, write this into your laws in terms of your legislation, enforce it, put the guys, prosecute the baddies and put them in jail. And if you do this, you can become a stay a member of the FATF. And South Africa is one of the founding members of the FATF. So as we all know by now, it, the FATF came in at a mutual evaluation of South Africa in 2019. Now, what that means is it's an inspection. They came to mark us. And as far as our technical compliance is concerned, this is where they marked our legislation, such as our Financial Intelligence Centre Act, FICA. They found us lacking in about a half of the categories. So we failed. So they said to us in 2019, or they released the report a bit later, they said to us, we're coming back at the end of 2022 to see if you have now successfully prosecuted the guys behind state capture, if you've amended your laws and so on. And if you haven't, you could be grey listed. So of course, we made quite a few changes to our legislation, but when the FATF came back, they found that we didn't make enough changes and that we weren't implementing the law successfully. So they gray listed us in February this year. So that puts us in the company of the likes of Nigeria and Cambodia, Cayman Islands, Albania, Yemen, and so on. Now, what does it mean to be gray listed? It means that other members of the FATF see us as a high risk jurisdiction. So if they do business with us, they have to do an additional due diligence on us. They have to do an enhanced due diligence on entities or clients being in South Africa. So that makes it more expensive for them. Their group policies may dictate that they don't want to deal with countries that have been grey listed by the FATF. So it makes it expensive uh, to deal with us or they're prohibited from dealing with us. So it's not good for our economy at all. So when we try to avoid being grey listed, we did three main things. We amended the schedules to FICA. Now, the schedules to FICA, specifically Schedule 1, sets out 
which persons or organizations would constitute accountable institutions for the purpose of FICA. Now, what is an accountable institution? Traditionally, it's our banks, it's our financial services providers, it's our lawyers. And what this means, it is that entity that must FICA you before they do business with you. So we all know we've all opened a bank account and sometimes we're quite frustrated because they say to us they have to feed us. It's because they're trying to prevent money laundering and the like. So the list we expanded on to include a whole lot of new categories, which I will get onto soon. Then our general laws, AML Act, Amendment Act was also passed in December. And this act means five pieces of legislation including FICA, including um, the Companies Act, and so on. And it amends these pieces of legislation to cater for beneficial ownership registries so that we can establish who the one body, the human being is, who ultimately controls a company or a trust or a partnership so that we can see who actually pockets the money at the end, who controls that legal entity, because of course, legal entities, trusts, partnerships are often used for the likes of money laundering. Our Pocketara Amendment Act, which is, Pocketara is of course our Anti-Terrorism Act, was also slightly amended in December. So the new accountable institutions that were added to Schedule 1 of FICA are life insurance business, Short-term insurers were going to be included as well, but eventually they weren't included in the final amendments. Credit providers under the National Credit Act and certain credit providers not under the National Credit Act. So in a nutshell, you trigger the National Credit Act if you sell goods on terms, if you provide credit, and for the luxury of being given credit, you must pay a fee or an interest or another charge. Now, if you provide this credit to human beings or to companies with a threshold or turnover below 1 million rand, then you are regulated by the National Credit Act. But if you provide this credit to entities excluded from the NCA because they are companies above a million rand, um, then you are still an accountable institution provided you charge some sort of fee or interest for this privilege to pay off. If you're on the business of a money or value transfer provider, previously this only triggered money remitters. It's been changed to money or value transfer provider because of course we can use the likes of um, uh, airtime transfers to launder money as well. Certain crypto asset service providers. And then the middle one, businesses dealing in high value goods where a transaction regardless of how many payments that transaction involves, is for an item exceeding a 100,000 Rand value. It's not services, we get asked this question very often, it's only if you um, sell goods and an item costs more than a 100,000 Rand. So not the basket of items, so if I sell 10 mobile phones at 10,000 Rand each, and it's a basket of 100,000 Rand, it doesn't trigger this provision, but the provision is triggered if I sell a gearbox, or I sell gold, or I sell diamonds, or I sell art, a motorboat, a prize bull. So whatever you're selling, if the item is more, of, of, more than 100,000 Rand, you would now be seen to be an accountable institution. And then certain trustees, and companies that establish entities, establishing companies. So basically, if you are a trustee and you're doing this for commercial purpose, you are not doing it, say, for a family trust or on an occasional basis. You're doing it on an ongoing basis and it's not a charitable undertaking. And you are dealing in any way with trust property as defined in the Trust Property Control Act. So that it is any property administered in terms of a written trust deed, then you trigger this provision as well. So we see BE, employment schemes and the like, triggering this provision. If you trigger this provision, then the each trustee, not the trust itself, each trustee constitutes an accountable institution. Now I've been carrying on about accountable institutions. What does it mean? So first of all, 
the first thing that you must do is you must appoint a compliance officer unless you're a sole practitioner then you would be your own compliance officer but you have to appoint a compliance officer you need this officer to be able to register online with the FIC as an accountable institution on the Go AML system. This is something that the compliance officer or the sole practitioner must do itself. You cannot outsource this. So for example, lawyers can't do it on your behalf because we can't share login details with the client. So you have to register as an accountable institution. This was supposed to happen 90 days after publication of these amendments in the Gazette. So we're already out of time. And the FICA said those who were supposed to register and didn't register are on their radar and you're currently non-compliant. So I do urge you, if you were supposed to register and you didn't register, this is not going away. So this is not going to be amended anytime soon. Please do register. Very importantly, you have to develop and of course implement a risk management or compliance program, and we call this an RMCP. Now, an RMCP is basically a fancy term for an anti-money laundering policy based on risk. And this is where the risk-based approach comes in, and Jim and Suhad are going to speak to this in quite some detail. But basically what the risk-based approach entails is you have to identify who are your low-risk clients and who are your high-risk clients. If you're dealing with a low risk client, you shouldn't be wasting all your resources on identifying and verifying it. You should rather, rather be spending your resources on the high risk clients. You must do certain basic things for all your clients, but the higher the risk, the more you have to do. And this is so on the radar of the regulators at the moment. So important that you identify and you customize your risk, your risk rating and your risk controls in your RMCP, and you have to conduct training. Now, the figure's not specific on how often and how long such training must be, but training must be conducted. Now, as far as your RMCP is concerned, it has to be approved by the highest level of authority, such as your board of directors or senior management. Very importantly, you must use section 42 of FICA as a checklist. And you must literally check that your RMCP covers absolutely everything addressed in section 42. If the Financial Intelligence Center, the FIC had to mark you, it would also use section 42 and check that you do comply with each provision. Now, first of all, you have to check whether a person you're dealing with is an existing client or prospective client? And are you entering into a single transaction or a business relationship? You have to do more in respect of clients with whom you enter into a business relationship with. So in your RMCB, you have to set out in your world, what is a single transaction? What is a business relationship? In my world, for example, if I had to draft a single RMCB for a client, that would be a single transaction. If I acted as your legal advisor on an ongoing basis, that would be a business relationship, but there's no one size fits all. It's very different in each organization. Very important, your RMCP, because it's an AML policy based on risk, needs to set out in detail how you identify, assess, monitor, mitigate, and then of course manage your risk. You also have to deal with section 20A, and this section simply says, do not deal with anonymous or fictitious clients. So if somebody comes to you and says, I, don't want, to, I want to deal with you on a no names basis, or my name is Mickey Mouse, you cannot deal with them. Provide for the establishment and verification of an identity. Now, what is the difference between the two? Establishment is saying to Sohad, Sohad, who are you? And she says, I'm Sohad Jacobs. Verification entails me checking that Suhad is Suhad. And the higher risk she is, the more I must do to make sure Suhad is Suhad. And then you also have to set out how you are going to monitor and check that transactions are consistent with what you know about your client. So if you know your client is, for example, a teacher, they make X amount of money, um, they usually pay you by means of an EFT, and all of a sudden they come with large amounts of cash. This is now inconsistent with your KYC, what you know about your client. So if you have a business relationship with a client, not a once-off transaction, you have to conduct 
ongoing due diligence and monitoring. And that's also in line with the requirements of the Protection of Personal Information Act, Poppy. So this is not a once off and now we walk away. If it's a business relationship, we must make sure that the information we have remains up to date, remains accurate, and it also entails us checking that our transactions are consistent with what we know about the client. When you're dealing with a legal person, a trust or a partnership, that should be warning lights for money laundering. And FICA expects you to do more. You need to look at the nature of the business relationship. And you also need to look at beneficial owner. Who's the warm body? Who's the human being who ultimately controls and pockets the money? You have to provide for what you are going to do if you doubt the veracity of information that has been provided to you during the customer due diligence process. You would normally repeat the steps. And of course, if you cannot get the customer due diligence information out of the person, you would either have to um, end the term, uh, to terminate the business relationship or not conclude any more further transactions with the person. You have to deal with how are you going to examine complex and unusually large transactions and unusual patterns where it seems like you are being used for money laundering purposes. You have to deal with customer due diligence, ongoing customer due diligence and what you're going to do if you suspect that a transaction is unusual. How are you going to terminate an existing relationship if you cannot figure the person? And how are you going to determine whether a person is a politically exposed person or prominent influential person? Very important, you must also deal with enhanced due diligence. When you now realize you're dealing with a high risk client such as a politically exposed person, what are you going to do more? For example, senior management approval is usually required for our PEPs and our PEPs. Um, source of wealth, source of income. Uh, you might want to ping a credit bureau as well to check that the information is um, accurate. Instead of just seeing a copy of an identity document, you might ask them for a certified copy and the like. You also have to deal with the manner in which and where you are going to keep records. Are your records kept in electronic format, hard copies? Has it been outsourced? If it has been outsourced, you're supposed to notify the FIC. And you also have to deal with when transactions are reportable. A provision that gives us some headaches in practice, section 42.2Q, that says you also have to deal with how the RMCP is going to be implemented in branches and subsidiaries of all your other operations in foreign countries. So FICA expects you to roll out the FICA standards at your foreign operations. Now, foreign operations go beyond branches and subsidiaries. So branches, subsidiaries, or foreign operations would have to adhere to your RMCP as well, unless they're prohibited in their law from implementing FICA. You also have to deal with the sharing of information in a group of companies and make sure that you keep information confidential. This is to detect um, unusual transactions. And of course, your privacy policy in terms of Poppy must also deal with the sharing. And you might want to have for a group of companies binding corporate rules or group data protection policy or data sharing agreement to cater for this. Um, you also have to set out how you are going to implement your RMCP. So, it mustn't just be a document or template that has been bought, but you don't implement it. Of course, you must train your staff and you have to implement it. And then you have to uh, deal with other prescribed matters. The prescribed matters that they're talking about here are what has, ever, what, what has been um, legislated in terms of directives. And we recently saw some new directives being passed and we'll touch upon that as well. Very important as well, if a paragraph in section 42, a subparagraph doesn't apply to your organization, it's very important that you set out that it doesn't apply. Don't just delete it. So for example, if you don't have foreign operations or you don't take cash, you have to say that. If you don't deal with trusts or juristic persons, you do have to say it. I've mentioned that the RMCP must be signed off 
by the highest level of management, and they can be held personally liable for non-compliance with FICA. And of course, your RMCP must be reviewed um, at regular intervals, for example, annually, or if the law changes, or if a um, regulator tells you to review it. And of course, trigger events, the FIC wants to see that the regulators want to see in your RMCP that you recognize that there are certain trigger events. As far as the rule versus risk-based approach is concerned, the rule-based approach, which ended in 2017, were those old regulations that said, if I open a bank account, the bank needs to have sight, and of course, bank, I mean, any accountable institution needed to have sight of my copy of my identity document, they had to get a copy of my tax number, they had to see utility bills and the like. This fell away several years ago and was replaced by the risk-based approach, where you can determine how you are going to verify the identity of the client, but of course, that needs to be set out in your RMCP and based on risk. And um, read guidance note seven and public compliance communication 45 issued by the FIC that gives us a lot of practical guidance in this regard. But of course, risk is the likelihood of certain uncertain events impacting us. A threat is that bad actor. A threat is that crook or group that wants to target us. Our vulnerabilities is why would they want to target us? Why don't they go to another um, accountable institution? They might want to target us because uh, we only operate online and we've got easy KYC procedures and the like, but we have to identify it. And we have to identify the consequences if these threats used our vulnerabilities to try and use us for money laundering purposes. Various threats, um, are set out in, in the guidance note and the PCC, for example, the geographic locations where you operate, does your product allow for third party payments and so on? Are you dealing with entities who are also grey listed by the FATF? Um, what type of clients are you dealing with? Are you just dealing with human beings or are you dealing with multi layered structures of ownership? A trust owns an, uh, a company and the company is owned by another trust and so on. So that makes for more for higher risk. And by the way, I should have said in the beginning, these slides will be shared with you. And of course, there are other factors that we should look at, for example, financial inclusion and the importance to bank the unbanked. So risk rating, crucial that every single accountable institution goes and customizes their risk rating. It's not a one size fits all. You may want to use a risk matrix. And this is where Jimmy and Suhart come in, that they can help you to customize your risks and to help you implement controls to prevent money laundering. So we spoke about some duties on accountable institutions. The main duty here so far was to register with the FIC and to, to implement an RMCP. You also have to do customer due diligence in accordance with your RMCP, keep records, and certain transactions are reportable to the Financial Intelligence Center. As far as customer due diligence is concerned, I've mentioned to you that you have to implement a risk-based approach in dealing with legal persons, partnerships, and trusts usually carry a higher risk. FICA tells us what records should be stored for how long, but bear in mind, FICA speaks of five years. The Companies Act says if you are a company, and you have to store records in terms of the Companies Act or in terms of any other law, you need to keep those records for at least seven years unless the statute says longer. So the five-year period if your company would default up to seven years. Certain transactions must be reported, not all transactions. Cash transactions, coins and notes of 50,000 rand or more. If you're dealing with entities sanctioned by the UN, if you have a suspicious or an unusual activity or transaction, you also have to deal with report requests from the FIC. And lastly, international EFTs must be reported by our banks and our authorized dealers with limited authority and the post bank. There were certain FIC directives issued. Please note that these directives have the force of law, unlike guidance notes and PCCs, these have the force of law. For example, there's a self-reporting directive that says, if you have missed a report, you have to go and confess. 
we have to file certain submissions with FIC and we have to do employee screening. Non-compliance with FICA can lead to 15 years in jail or 100 million rand. So hefty, hefty consequences for non-compliance. And we've got no grace period, but the FIC has mentioned that for the first 18 months of will probably only issue naughty notices. But once you have a naughty notice, um, you know that they will be back. Lastly, I want to mention that we have developed a FICA toolkit that can help you fast track compliance. It includes some training, it includes an RMCP template, and of course, so hard and Jimmy will speak to it. They can also help you customize your risk controls. And at this point, so hard, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Suad Jacobs. I'm going to be chatting to you about Directive 8, and more particularly, I'll do an introduction for to the third party due diligence uh, process that uh, and the risk-based approach to screening clients that will be dealt with in detail by Jimmy. Now, Directive 8 became effective on the 31st of March, 2023. Uh, it requires that accountable institution, it applies firstly to all accountable institutions, and it requires that accountable institutions must screen prospective and current employees for competence and integrity periodically and in a risk-based manner. The FIC has issued that uh, PCC 55, so public compliance uh, note to inform accountable institutions on what it expects to see in this risk-based approach to screening employees. What's important to remember is that this risk-based approach, you have to determine the level of risk posed by employees or prospective employees, and then the screening process associated with, with new employees or with current employees must be proportionate to the level of risk that these prospective or current employees expose the accountable institution too. So the purpose of introducing Directive 8 is to ensure that employees don't expose, or at least that the risk that employees would expose accountable institutions to uh, money laundering or terrorist financing or proliferation financing is mitigated and managed uh, on a continuous basis. So the screening allows for ongoing management of your risk, but it also ensures that your employees uh, I have high st standards of competence and integrity. So what are some of the guidelines that have been suggested by the FIC that are set out in the PCC? For when screening for competence, you need to review the employee's previous at the very minimum PCC. And it's important to remember that PCC 55 sets out the minimum requirements of the FIC. There's no prohibition on enhancing your screening processes, but these are the, these are, this is the minimum of, of what the FIC would expect to see, that you need to review your employees and prospective employees' previous employment history, their references to ensure that they have the level of competence, that they have the level of experience that they say that they have. So you would be screening their competence and ability to perform the task. And secondly, integrity. Uh, whether the employee has a criminal record, particularly related to crimes of dishonesty, very important, because you would remember that money laundering, there are various predicate offences which would underlie an, an offence of money laundering. So the predicate offence would, for example, be the hijacking, the unlawful activity uh, that would give rise to the need to, to, to launder the money. So checking that your employees don't have a history of being involved in dishonesty or money laundering or other kinds of financial crime, and then to con the conduct of the employee. So once you've screened the, 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 once you screen the integrity of the employee, it's their past conduct, their current conduct, their conduct in terms of your code of conduct, is the employee exhibiting behavior in the organization that would be problematic? Um, whether the employee, and then there's also risk associated with the position that an employee uh, would occupy. So um, the role considerations, is this an employee that has that is engaging in, in, in bringing in new business? Are they authorizing transactions and the like? 
and that can expose an organization to higher to a higher degree of risk. Uh, whether the employee was previously previously held a senior decision making role and then contravened, um, you know, anti money laundering uh, legislation or was involved in conduct that is prohibited by the FIC. Another important consideration when you're screening for the integrity is whether the employee is a close associate or, in, or immediate family member that is a pup or a pet. Um, and do they come from a high, are they a national of a high risk jurisdiction? So there are various aspects that go into considering one, the competence of the employee, the integrity of the employee, other risk exhibited by the role of the employee, pre previous conduct of the employee, and most importantly, the screening needs to take place on a periodic basis. So it's not a one-off screening. Screening for new employees has to take place before, uh, you know, before they're employed. Screening for current employees have to take place has to take place as soon as there's been an amendment to the targeted financial sanctions list. So this is something that is has already come into operation on the 31st of March. We can assist you. Uh, with the process of developing an internal process to ensure that you assess your employees in a risk-based manner and that you adapt your screening procedures in line with the level of risk that an employee would expose the business to. Obviously, the lower the level of risk, the, the simpler the screening process it would be, the higher the level of risk, the more intense and enhanced, you would have to have enhanced screening procedures. That's everything that, we, that I'd like to chat to you about in respect of Directive 8. We'll now move on to the risk-based approach for screening clients. So an accountable institution requires a robust and appropriate due diligence process as part of its AML compliance program in order to comply with the FIC directives to not only avoid the pitfall of engaging with clients engaged in money laundering or terrorist financing or proliferation financing, but also to demonstrate to the regulator that it's an AI that has taken appropriate steps to mitigate the risk. What's important to remember is that a due diligence process in, in, this, in this type of environment and in, in, in a business environment would not only address the risks uh, posed by money laundering. These programs and these risk-based approach to assessing clients can also be used for other business partners and can be introduced as part of a holistic anti-bribery, anti-corruption, um, anti-sanctions, or you know, not in engaging with sanctioned individuals, as well as um, anti-bribery procedures. Thank you, next slide. So a client due diligence process aims to gather sufficient information for the accountable institution to be able to assess the risk posed by existing or prospective clients, and then in engaging in a business relationship with the AI. Gathering this information will help you to determine the level of risk that is posed by the client. Traditionally, you would categorize that into low, medium, or high risk. And then based on the rating of the client, you would determine whether or not enhanced due diligence procedures are required. So taking an informed initial decision as to whether the, uh, the accountable institution wish, want, wishes to enter into or continue the business arrangement with a client, whether it is initially decided to enter into or continue with a client assessed with high risk to determine whether the risk can be mitigated to a level that is acceptable. So where you've determined that a client is a high risk client, are you able to introduce enhanced due diligence that would allow you to reduce the risk that that client exposes you to, to a level that is acceptable to the organization. It's very important with high risk clients that there should be further additional monitoring procedures uh, and, and, to, and appropriate uh, clauses and warranties and representations to continue to ensure that you on a continuous basis manage the risk and monitor the risk that is posed by a medium to high risk client. So once there has been an initial assessment and you've determined that a client is either medium or high risk and you've introduced enhanced due diligence and there's been a decision to continue in a business relationship with this business partner, there would need to be continual monitoring to make sure that the risk hasn't changed 
and, and, and something has occurred to, 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 to place this client in a range where the risk is too high and you don't want to continue in a business relationship or the risk has decreased and enhanced due diligence, due diligence is no longer required. It's also very important to document the processes that are followed so that there is a record of the assessment and the enhanced due diligence process that has been undertaken and how the organization has on a continuous basis monitored the risk posed by a potential client. Thank you, next slide. So steps before designing and implementing a customer due diligence process, an appropriate AML compliance program must initially consider whether the accountable institution is exposed to the risk of money laundering and terrorist financing, and this has to be done through a risk assessment. It is important to understand before you introduce controls and before you determine which enhanced controls you want to introduce and where, to understand how the business is exposed uh, to the risk of money laundering and terrorist financing. The customer due diligence process should be designed to focus on preventing and mitigating the risks that may involve its prospective and current clients. So the customer due diligence process will also need to be flexible because you need to accommodate for changes that occur and, and for changes that occur in the AML and the terrorist financing landscape. So, and the customer due diligence process should be designed to complement and make use of existing processes of the accountable institution. So, similarly to Directive 8, in the implementation of the process to screen prospective employees, we encourage clients to ensure that they use existing controls and that those be, become part of the enhanced process to fulfill the requirements of Directive 8, similarly with third-party due diligence. It's important and that you use standard client vetting processes and enhance those processes so that the implementation of these of this process is not as onerous on the organization. Um, <clears throat> thank you, next slide. So a client due diligence process should be continuous throughout the life cycle of the business relationship with a client. And depending on the changing risk environment and the risk score ultimately attributed to the client, regular reassessments should take place at suitable junctures. And this, will, this is part of the entire process that we would, for example, design for a client. Uh, we would design the process for you and also take you through the enhanced due diligence procedures and discuss uh, in you know regular monitoring of the of prospective clients, I'm going to hand over to Jimmy, who will take you through the detailed process of creating a customer due diligence or a client due diligence process. Thanks, Jimmy. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy Hill. Um, what what we'd like to start off doing is. Um, looking at what a what a client uh, due diligence process typically looks like one of the key issues to set up right from the beginning is, is the is the approval process um, and we urge clients to design a lateral assessment review and approval process um, by involving a cross section of interested parties in the uh, in the accountable institution um, you then obtain input from various parts of the business. Um, you're able to like review risk ratings and approve sub processes. So make sure that when you're looking at your approval matrix to get input from the operational department that will be transacting with the client, the specialist uh, personnel responsible for the process, for example, uh, various functional and manager management levels responsible for the approval and sign off of the decision um, to engage with the, with the client. For example, um, also accessing input from finance, legal, and 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 compliance. Um, the uh, the act uh, the the FIC Act prescribes certain levels of approval. We'll deal with that a little later. Um, for instance, with the, uh, where senior management have to participate in the final approval process. 
at each step of the process, uh, it, it's really important to ensure that the interested parties that are participating in the process provide and document their input, their motivation for the accepting the client or note issues or red flags of concerned uh, or concerns identified, escalations and recommendations. It's very important that, uh, that a clear and discernible audit trail should be established and recorded. Um, ERA has spoken about the need for keeping records. Next slide, please. So um, here is an example of a, of a, of a, of a CDD process that we, that we often recommend to clients in, in performing third-party due diligence processes. We've broken it down into seven steps. First step would be an initial information gathering process. The second step would be an initial assessment where a scorecard would, would apply, um, resulting in an initial uh, risk scoring of the client. Step three would be a review of that initial assessment and the risk scoring that was attributed in step two. Step four would be the performance of enhanced due diligence procedures if required where there are concerns or where the initial uh, risk scoring, for instance, you may determine that, um, that, that initial risk ratings of medium um, and high warrant uh, the enhanced due diligence processes. Step five would then consider additional mitigating measures where the score remains above the comfort zone of the, uh, of, of the institution. And, uh, and and these may be varied. Uh, there may be ways to curtail or, or, or mitigate certain of the risks through uh, imposition of legal terms and conditions. Um, there may be uh, 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 there may be a reason to curtail or limit um, the availability of funds um, to the client uh, to 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 the prospective client, or there may be a, a, a need to limit uh, to limit or curtail. Um, certain transactions with the client. Step six would then be approving the client or, or not approving the client. And step seven is monitoring of the client. Next slide, please. So with the information gathering process, um, you may consider commencing the, complete, uh, commencing the process with completion of a questionnaire by the client. Um, and uh, and this is an approach that is uh, that is very often followed by institutions. Um, uh, the purpose of the client questionnaire is to alert the accountable institution to red flags, and therefore the questions raised in the questionnaire should be specific. Appropriate supporting documentation should be requested and provided by the client in support of the answers provided. And I go back again to the the point um, section twenty two of of the FIC Act. Uh, which requires supporting uh, documentation during the, the the client acceptance process. So these questions uh, may cover off the following, and this is pretty much driven by Chapter Three, Part One of 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 the FIC Act. It would be establishing the identity of the client, or in the instance that uh, that that a person is acting on behalf of the ultimate client, um, obtaining the information of the of the authority. Or, uh, of that person, the identity of the person acting on behalf of the ultimate client, as well as obtaining the identity of the ultimate client. Determining the nature of the envisaged or existence business relationship with, um, with the institution. Determining um, PIP or uh, or PEP status, and and the act is clear as to the definitions of a politically um, exposed person or a prominent influential person. Um, it sets out uh, sets out the various categories of persons that are uh, that, that are subject to it. For instance, uh, a prominent influential person uh, deals with the, the domestic. Um, side of things, and it includes the president, a government minister, pre uh, uh, premier of a, promise, a province, member of the executive uh, council of the province, province, executive mayor of a municipality, leader of a political party, uh, member of a royal family or senior traditional leader, etc., etc. There's, there, there's a myriad of, um, of persons that are regarded as having PIP status. As far as the PEP, or um, or as the Act words it, uh, foreign prominent public person status or uh, foreign prominent public official status, again, um, the the Act 
prescribes um, any person who holds or was held for any time in the preceding 12 months in any foreign country a prominent public function and includes various examples of such uh, such uh, prominent public functions. So that needs to be checked. Um, it's also very important to determine the relationships um, whether whether the uh, whether the prospective or existing client has re has relationships with the PIP or the FPP, and uh, and to obtain declarations as to whether the client is an immediate family member or close business associate of a of a PIP or FPP. And again, this is uh, this is spelt out. The definitions of a family member or close associate are spelt out in the Act under Section Twenty One H. If a legal structure, um, disclosure of the nature of the legal structure, beneficial uh, ownership and control and key management of, of the legal structure. So if we're talking about a company, if we're talking about a trust, etc., cetera, um, that level of detail needs to be obtained. Um, in, in some instances, the act is fairly onerous uh, this, it, and requires a customer due diligence process on every member of a, uh, of a, of a partnership, every partner, and, and includes um, a CDD process on each and every trustee of a trust. The source of income, wealth of the client, declarations, including reputation, uh, um, and this regard, th this relates to uh, instances of violations of law and regulation, and then possibly financial information that may not be publicly um, available for listed entities in South Africa. The, that information is usually available and is required to be publicly available. Um, but for uh, for PTY limits, etc., that's going to have to be requested. Step two is the initial assessment, and this may be broken down into two steps. The first step being a pre-screening process, and you may consider a pre-screening process. The Act provides for performing a pre-screening process or a, a, or a shortened due diligence process where the determination is made as to whether the client should be subject to a client uh, due diligence process. And the second step, if deemed subject to the process, the initial risk assessment of the client. So with the pre-screening process, if, uh, if it is decided that the client is excluded from the, um, from the client uh, due diligence process on an initial consideration of various factors, because you believe it does not pose any form of risk to the institution, then um, and then it's closed off at that stage. Again, it's really important to um, uh, to uh, document the process that was followed, um, including responses and supporting material provided by the client um, and the uh, the assessment of the nature and complexity of the business relationship, including the values involved in that relationship and transaction. Because ultimately, if something goes wrong, the regulator is going to be asking you for the documents and you need to be in a position to justify um, a decision or a transaction that uh, took place um, up to five years ago, and in many cases, up to seven years ago. Next slide, please. Um, where it's determined that the uh, client is in scope for, uh, for, for the client due diligence process, then um, the first step would be to also um, assess the client through a review of easily accessible public information on the client. And you may want to include, um, as good practice here already, um, a screening of the client against the United Nations san sanctions lists, which are available um, in the public domain on, on websites. Um, obviously, um, doing, doing Google searches and, uh, and more advanced um, uh, searches of the public media space um, would also be a plus at this stage. At this stage, you're also considering the client against the risk factors used by the institution to identify money laundering or, or, or terrorist financing. And this goes back to a point that Seward raised earlier, um, is that this whole process um, should be built around your initial business risk assessment um which identifies those areas those transactions or those products um, that are offered by the institution that pose 
um, the risk of money laundering or terrorist financing or um, or uh, proliferation of uh, of uh, weapons of mass destruction transactions. So it's really important that that initial business risk assessment is performed before you uh, try to put together a client due diligence process. Um, a scoring mechanism should then be set up from the initial assessment process, which provides an initial risk rating for the client. And this is usually set up as low, medium or high risk. The questionnaire, the initial questionnaire will be assessed um, and certain points um, can be ascribed to certain responses received or the lack of certain responses received. And the initial in scope uh, initial assessment um, process as well, and and that will then uh, bring you to a, a to an initial scoring of low, medium, or high risk. Next slide, please. Um, obviously, this process needs to be uh, needs to be re reviewed, and that review needs to be robust, applying appropriate skepticism and common sense to the responses, motivations, and risk scoring attributed during the initial assessment. Um, the process has got to be flexible um, because you may uh, want to adjust those initial ratings at this stage already um, upwards or downwards. Um, and the process also should allow for additional process, uh, procedures if required before final risk rating is assigned to the client. In the initial um, step two review process, you may have ascribed certain scorings to um, to certain responses given to uh, to you by the by the uh, by the prospective or existing client, and the uh, the initial the initial um, uh, due diligence procedures that have been followed. Um, but th those those may come to a figure that that, that just don't make sense. Number one. It may it may score a high risk rating where quite clearly, if you look at the uh, the, the the transactions that are likely to be involved, etc., the the type of client, etc., the scoring should have been a lower risk. So um, so there may be a mechanism for override within your process, and similarly, a low risk um, assessment may initially be provided, but certain other concerns have not been. Uh, uh, assessed in a proper manner and during this review process those issues come to the fore and there should be a, a mechanism for for then um adjusting that score that scoring upwards as well up or down those processes need to be motivated and they need to be recorded um within with, with, within the whole process um and again, um, retained for, for, for the necessary period. Next slide, please. Step four is performing the enhanced due diligence procedures. So um, where, where the client has been assessed as having a higher risk rating than low, um, we would normally recommend that uh, enhanced due diligence procedures are performed. And these may include the following. The screenings by third party providers of due diligence uh, procedures. There are several providers on the market um, that provide access um, and automated access in, in uh, very often to, um, to a host of databases, global and local databases. I'm talking of the, I'm, not, I'm not trying to promote any of them, but I'm talking of things like WorldCheck, I'm talking of AlexisNexis, there are a horde of them out there. Um, so that's one thing is is making use of a third party provider who has a, who has a host of various databases um, available and uh, and who can assist in in that process. It may often require site visits where the client is a legal entity um, or interviews with the client or in the case of a legal entity with management and employees of prospective client. It's one of the it's one of the issues uh, facing the, the the financial world at the moment, where transactions are moving away, or or the, or the conclusion of business transactions is moving away from a face to face basis and to an electronic platform through through banking apps, etc. Um, but there may ultimately be a need for a face to face for you to be able to assess whether um, whether whether the client poses this risk. So again, you've gone through these enhanced due diligence procedures. You then perform a reassessment of, of that initial um, risk rating and attribute a new risk rating to it. And the matter is then resubmitted to, to the next level approver. Next slide, please. 
Step five at this stage is looking at whether the client risk rating remains unacceptably high and whether any mitigating factors can be taken into consideration or mitigating steps can be implemented um, in order to lower that risk or to provide uh, the institution with, uh, with sufficient comfort um, to, to drive it to progress with, with the business uh, relationship. Please note that, that there are instances where, um, where under the FEEC Act, um, further, uh, further steps, or, or not further steps, um, due, to, due to a lack of information, failure of information um, to be provided by the, by the client, et cetera, there is a, um, a legal prohibition on entering into any business relationship with that client or um, or a requirement to terminate any existing business relationship with that client. And you'll find the details of that in Section 21E of the Act. The last measure is then approval of the client. Um, so a decision should be made as to whether to enter then into the business relationship or not with the client. Um, with a high risk rating or where the client is a PIP or a PIP, um, it, approval must be provided by the senior management of, of, of the accountable institution. Um, so, so there are those guidelines within the Act. And again, this would be uh, built in into your, whole pro, into your, into your process um, so, that, uh, so that it would be clear that, uh, that, that approval at the highest level is required for the business relation to, to go forward. Um, finally, step seven um is is the monitoring of the client the on uh, the ongoing monitoring of the client and with the ongoing monitoring of the client uh, this this is this is pretty much spelt out again uh, as a requirement within the FIC act um the act uh, refers to ongoing due diligence and uh and, and you'll see the provisions in sections 21 c and 21 d of the act um and this is to to uh, to address the following issues changing of risks Due to internal factors, for instance, uh, changes in the structure operations of the uh, of the accountable institution, external factors, um, which then relate to the client as well, changes in sources of income, ownership of of, of the client if it's a legal entity, new legislation, um, increased regulation, etc. New risks may emerge; existing risks may diminish as well. So the uh, the due diligence process must continue over the client throughout the life cycle of the business relationship. Um, again, organizations should also, as a minimum, re-perform the, uh, re -perform the uh, client due diligence process over the clients, considering the changes in risk and according to regular schedules. Uh, for example, annual for high-rate risk-rated clients, biannually for medium risk-rated clients, every three years for low-risk-rated clients. So uh, your wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. We will sh share the slide deck with you. The, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box, and then we will respond in an email when we send out the deck. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.